What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? I hope you've had a wonderful week. So a lot has been going on in the world of science this week, and I wanted to get on and discuss it with my good friend and colleague, and it's been a while, Jason Stefan. Jason, how are you doing? Doing very well, thank you. Good. It's starting to get warm in Las Vegas. So this is this is something I'm going to ask you about, actually. So just to remind you, Jason is a professor of astronomy at the University of Las Vegas in Nevada. And today we're going to be discussing earthquakes on Mars, or maybe we should say Mars quakes, and the InSight lander, maybe throwing in a bit of Martian weather and some of the odd shapes we'd seen on Mars. Apparently there are four, uh, Jason, we're going to get your thoughts on this, potentially malicious extraterrestrial civilizations in the Milky yeah. Way. So we can have watch a... Watch out for them. We'll watch out for them, definitely. So very Independence Day. <laughs> Uh, neutrons have been doing some funny things in the double slit experiment. So we're going to have a chat about that as well. NASA seems to think that the universe is expanding in a weird way. So we might have a little chat about that. And finally, Jason, if we have time, might finally explain to me the uh, optimal way to board a plane, because this is uh, something that he's put a lot of work into. And it's a, a little bit of his uh, out of his claim to fame and, and maybe a few more things than that. So before we get into all of that, I'm going to I'm going to touch on what you just uh, teed up nicely, Jason. What is the weather like this time of year in Las Vegas? Because I imagine it's pretty horrendous, is it or not? Oh, no, it's not horrendous yet. Um, so it's around 100 F, which if I put it in, that's a 38 C. That's pretty warm, um, buddy. Yeah, it's great. That, that's the right <laughs> weather. That's like that's like prime <laughs> weather. Have you got the air con on or not? Um, no, actually, I have a small space heater on. All right, okay. Fine. Because they they have, like, when it gets warm outside, then they turn the air conditioning on, and the location of the thermostat is not anywhere near the um, outside, like, where the vents are for the air conditioning. Yeah. So this is something, if anyone ever comes to the southwest United States, you'll notice in a lot of large buildings that the air conditioning is really cold, um, and it's uncomfortably cold. It's, uh, and, it's different over there. The guy, uh, I had a chat with a, a professor, Dave Toback, and uh, he's in Texas. I guess he's in Austin. And he was like, I've got the air con running. I'm quite happy here. Temperatures get ridiculous during the summer. Yeah, so, but we also have a, you know, our humidity is zero. So mm. it does make a difference. So hot and dry, yes? Yeah. When's it going to get the worst? Uh, the last couple of weeks of July is usually the worst. What, what um, are we talking there? So there it peaks at, if you're not on the road, like walking down the middle of the street, it peaks at about 115, which is 46. 46. Yeah. Oof. So the way to think about it is there's a song by Midnight Oil um, where they, uh, I think it's Beds Are Burning, right? Where it's, um, you steam in 45 degrees. <laughs> So that's basically the Mojave and the Outback, I guess, are similar so, in that regard. So basically people become boil in a bag meals so that, like at the end of. Uh... Well, the main thing is that it's hard to regulate your body temperature when the outside air is warmer than your body. Yeah. So um, you don't feel sweating like you can tell that you're sweating, but you don't feel like you're sweating. And then when you walk inside, then all of a sudden it starts to you just drench everywhere. Like it all comes out <laughs> um, and it does make it so that. You know, your body's used to having the energy leave instead of come in. And so um, that's where a, even like five minutes in a swimming pool at the end of the day really can help reset your, your body. You know, after a couple of days of 115, um, you get a headache and yeah, 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 it yeah. Doesn't, doesn't seem to be a way to get rid of it. So it's uh, the big thing over here, of course, is the, the, Queen's, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. So everyone's been going... Uh... Everyone's been going mad about that. And that makes her the longest reigning monarch in history? Uh, quite possibly. You know, I didn't I didn't look into that. It's 70, 70 years. That the only thing I've been looking into is the fact that we get four days off. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are all off over here. As, so uh, it's like Thanksgiving Day weekend. We get that every year. <laughs> so maybe maybe we should become a republic then. So there's uh and there's some uh there's some street parties and things going on. I think there's one near us on on sunday it might even be on the road outside so i might have a wander out and uh, see what's going on so that's been kind of interesting on your end you just came off 
the back of a conference, didn't you? Before we talked, you were uh, talked last. You were desperately trying to get this conference sorted. So, how did that Exoplanets conference go? What were the what were the highlights? Anything new? Anything we need to to know about? Because uh, I'm I was, sure I, I was told you were on excellent form during this. So uh, that, that was that was my goal. Yeah. yeah. Um, now I want as long as you don't tell anyone. Um, I'm actually wearing the wig backwards. I didn't realize until after the conference <laughs> that the wig is supposed to go the other direction. Um, <clears throat> so the i mean i thought that it went pretty well the best people to ask are the people who attended um they said it went pretty but, well as well so uh, yeah so the conference was it was good to get everyone back together again um there was a day off in the middle yeah. so you know when you attend conferences if it's basically just five days of non-stop talking you get you know by the end of the third day you're worn out you you don't want to sit anymore. Yeah. Um, it's hard to internalize anything and it, and it peters out as a consequence. Like yeah. people don't want to be there. Yeah. Um, so the last speaker on the last day is, yeah. you know, like who do we put there? And so this time, one of the main things I wanted to do with this conference was to have a lot of time for people to um, collaborate, socialize, kind of remember what it's like to yeah. be in the presence of other humans. And so there were long coffee breaks. There were, um, there was one day where basically the whole morning and afternoon were off. And then there was a public event in the evening. The, the public event was sponsored by a different organization, but it was still me that organized it. Um, and so on that day off, it was really cool to see because on that day off, people went to the Grand Canyon. They went to yeah. Zion National Park. They went to Death Valley. They went, I mean, there was probably a, a seven hour spread in both directions about where people <laughs> went on that day off. Um, and then they came back together um, the next day and it was back to the grind. And uh, so it was really, I think, really productive. My goal was to make it um, the conference that people talk about for 20 years into the future. So well, it sounds like a big, a big part of it was the, these are the sort of first conferences back out of lockdown and COVID and this kind of thing as well, isn't it? So it's. Yeah, but I'm not going to put that asterisk by my <laughs> by the results, because then. So I, I agree, you know, people, there are a lot of uh, travel budgets that haven't been spent. And so um, there's definitely that incentive for people to come. I know, and I know that some people couldn't, it was right at the end of the semester for a lot of people. So there were, the, I think the conference was more young than normal in terms of, it was mostly like a lot of graduate students and postdocs mm. and not quite as many faculty, although there were certainly faculty there, but I think the mix of faculty was a little bit less simply because they were still teaching classes. Yeah. Um, and it was it was packed. I mean, in terms of like the science program, the number of excellent presentations that didn't get an opportunity to speak and had uh, a slot in the poster session were was huge. So it was really productive in that regard. Um, just there was so much good science to to be had. I will say I would say that there I saw a whole lot of you know, great, fantastic new results. But the fact of the matter is I really didn't see much at all. Um, and uh, so I'm now the talks are available online. Nice. And, and so I'm going back through and saying, okay, what, what actually happened while I was there? Well, you were facilitating, you know, yeah. You know, finding the staples and um, putting posters up and, you know, making sure that the, the catering was positioned in the right spot. Sounds like a, sounds like you were doing a wedding plan, but uh... yeah, well, it was it kind of I mean it was to you know the big event. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed hosting people here. A lot of people were kind of nervous. You know, what's it going to be like in Las Vegas? And the venue was great. The food was so the closing ceremony. Um, they had a, like an ice cream bar where you could go up and get no. Yeah, I'm gonna have to become an astronomer. It's, it's getting out. It's it getting, was, it's it getting was out cool. Now. I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to do it. You seen the. Uh, you seen the new Top Gun film or not? Saw it the other day. I have you have I seen it? I, yeah, what I'll probably think? go back and watch it again. It was it was good, wasn't it? I I really it was definitely it. good. So uh, we've we've got a plan. I've got a I've got a friend Ramsey who is a, I think you I think we've talked on stream before with with Ramsey. He's a a sensor expert, and we we both really enjoyed the film. But there's some dodgy science in there, and uh -huh. uh, for those who 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 might not have noticed, there's some centripetal accelerations which are like north of 50 100 g which just aren't well i can't, he, he I, can't should... I can't have them i can't be having them so i'm going to do a a science breakdown of it and a technological breakdown of it 
for, so for, I think for the, the highest G's that I saw was like 10, right? Right. But um, what they show on screen is not 10. Oh, I didn't, I didn't see um, the anything. Simulations they show are not 10. So I, I, I'm basically gonna, just going to do a sort of anal breakdown of it. You're right. They say it's 10. But when you look at all the numbers they show and stuff and do the calculations, they're not. So, mm -hmm. so we're going to have a look through all the sort of sensors and the setup. And, and he knows a lot about sort of um, military tech and sensors and, and radars and these kind of things. So we're going to have a chat through that. But um, I'm, so glad, I, I'm glad I, you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, the, the first one came out when I was just a kid. So uh, yeah, it was what I liked about it um, is, well, for one thing, they didn't um, not too many they didn't spoilers kind of though, kill Jason. off the they didn't kill off the protagonist. That's right. A spoiler. Or they they didn't. Uh, <laughs> let me let me say that they didn't um, tear down the anta yeah. the protagonist. Yeah, That's yeah. what I meant to yeah, say. Yeah. So they didn't take um, Top Gun like Tom Cruise's character and turn him into you know some lazy person in the future who's. Yeah, yeah. Which um, is what they do with a lot of film. That 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 was actually. A nice they didn't thing. do what they they didn't do what they did to Luke Skywalker. Yeah. No, I, he he was he was very much the same character, but he he felt like older and more mature. There are a, if you go back and watch the old one, it is a little bit cringy in places, uh -huh. but they still kept his his like capability and how good he is at what he does, but made him mm -hmm. a kind of more mature figure, but still really capable and enjoyable to watch. So I think I think they did that that really nicely. They got a nice balance, and bringing yeah, I in, think part of that was so he starts off as a test pilot. Um, and I think that is a way of capturing, like maintaining his uh, skill set yeah. um, and also maintaining his um, kind of rogue <laughs> style. They they linked it through really nicely, didn't they? They, they kept those sort of threads going and made it. So, even the callbacks to the previous films by bringing in spoilers again, if you don't want to hear, close your, close your ears. But by bringing in Goose's son, they were able to do all of the callbacks to the old film and they all yeah. felt sensible and natural through that vehicle rather mm -hmm. than what they do with a lot of sort of remake films or follow-up films now is they just sort of crowbar in, oh, you remember this, this happened in the last film, this is funny, isn't it? Whereas with that, it felt like it came up naturally because he had to interact with the son and sort of relive little pieces of the, of the, right. of the previous film, which I, I thought... That was a really nice vehicle to to do the fan service and do the the sort of nostalgia trip. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was it. Was definitely a cool film. Um, it was also not uh, the um, there wasn't a whole lot of CGI. It wasn't all fake. Um, so like their responses to turning, you know, that, you know they had what, the one thing that I noticed is how often they put their hands on the canopy. Yeah. Um, to stabilize themselves as they were filming. <laughs> I didn't notice that, but now I'm gonna when I watch it the second time, I'm gonna check. But yeah, apparently they did they did a lot of the filming themselves, which is uh, absolutely amazing. The last thing before we get into these uh, these topics, I noticed just came out the other day, is that the JWST first images, so the first fully focused, fully calibrated, everything, all the bells and whistles ready, is gonna be on the 12th of July. So just for anyone who wanted to know that the first proper full science images are going to come out in a press conference on the 12th of July. So in about what, five, six weeks. What day of the week is that? Let's uh, see. You'd have to check that for me. July 12. Huh. Is it a Friday? That's a Tuesday. A Tuesday. Interesting. So uh, that'll be really interesting. What are you most looking forward to about that? Just, I guess, just it being up and running, right? Yeah, probably up and running. And then um, I'm happy for my colleagues who are really excited about it. I'm, I'm not, it's not that I'm not excited about it, but it's not really my instrument. Um, <laughs> what's, uh, what's, so. what, what, what thing or what observation is most useful for your work? What are you most mm. looking forward to seeing from it? That's a good question. I suspect that um because everyone's been squabbling and fighting for time obviously on this and i know uh -huh. a lot of people have, have got their time and a lot of people haven't um i think that right now probably like planet forming regions um maybe some planetary albedo type things um so i don't really study atmospheres yeah 
Um, although, you know, I, it's, it's not that I shouldn't necessarily, but, you know, there's a whole group of people in exoplanets who study atmospheres, and this is really their instrument. Um, I got Kepler, and that was up my alley, and Webb is going to provide complementary science to, uh, to them. So I, I doubt that I will um, ever request time to observe something unless something kind of pops out of the blue, like, oh, this would be an interesting kind of weird thing to look at. Um, this is really an instrument for the other colleagues in my field who are studying planet forming regions and stellar or planetary atmospheres and things like that. I think you'd be and the then for the queue now anyway. It's, uh, it seems well, to yeah. And hot for time. you know, we, I test is still flying. So there's still a lot of work to do on test data. And then the Plato mission is coming up in a decade. And so the, the cycle, you know, swinging back and forth between like, what's the next thing that you do with the, now that we have data from Kepler, what's the next instrument and how does that um, complement what's been done and who is in line to be able to provide that. Good stuff. So it'll be cool. And then there's going to be a bunch of cosmology that comes out of it as well. And that's going to be something that I'm interested in seeing is what, what new cosmology results come out of it. Cause I haven't been following the cosmology and like particle astrophysics we'll have, uh, we'll have to get literature will, will on and have a chat with him about that i think um yeah my cosmology is not the best so uh he might be someone worth getting on because uh that's his field i guess mm -hmm. so but it's pretty impressive the difference between you know jwst and spitzer like oh there's quite a bit that you can see when you, <laughs> you know <clears throat> i did uh i did I, I can't remember if i showed i think i showed you last time but it's it's like uh it's like taking the Vaseline off the lens. You just you just see all this all this stuff pop out. Right. Uh, when you look at the same field, it's amazing stuff. So yes, everyone watching, first images are in six weeks. So it looks like finally the uh, the long wait will be over. And I imagine they probably have those images already. To be honest, if they're if they're talking about a, um, yeah, I'm sure that they're done. I'm sure that they're taken. That now it's just a matter of Cleaning processing and finding out like. You know, because they want to be able to say something besides here's an image. Exactly. It'd be like, now write your slides for these. Exactly. Right. So first uh, proper bit of science that we that we promised. So NASA's InSight lander has recorded a monster earthquake, or maybe we should call it a Mars quake. They're not calling it an earthquake on here for obvious reasons. Mars quake uh, on Mars. And this occurred on the 4th of May, 2022. So about a month ago. And uh, it was a. Oh, so that was the same day that May 4th was the day that um, we had our day off where people could go collaborate at the Grand Canyon. Isn't that Star Wars Day, May 4th? Yeah. May the 4th. Be and that's also why we had the public event that evening so that um, mm. we could capitalize on the. Um, so, so May the 4th was never a thing until like the second trilogy came out, the prequels. <laughs> at least not that I know of. So. Can you tell us anything about NASA's insight or do you want me to go into a little bit of a spiel about um, what I've... Well, the main things that I know about it is that it's essentially a seismometer that yeah. they've planted on the surface of Mars to see how does Mars shake. And what you can get with that information is that it basically tells you what the interior looks like. Yeah. Um, because the different ways that the planet shakes, you know, if you have a layer at, at some depth, you'll have seismic waves that will bounce off of that layer or refract um, as it goes down. And so you can get a good image of like a cross section of what the uh, interior of the planet looks like. Exactly. So that they measured this uh, magnitude five earthquake, which apparently is, is not particularly, I, I don't have a sense for these and maybe you have more of a sense for these being closer to California, but magnitude five is not actually that big is it so if we look at the no not really you would feel it like there's a i felt i don't know maybe three or four earthquakes since moving here um and they're basically magnitude five and of course they all come from california um and so, so, so it says maybe slight damage you'll probably feel it maybe slight damage to structures but it's it's not something that's gonna gonna be ripping down buildings but for Mars, no, you, you have to get up to like seven for that to. And this is a this is a log scale, right? <clears throat> yeah. Right. So every every step you go is ten times more powerful. 
So mm. five, seven, seven and a half is a big deal. Nine and a half is like the largest ones ever recorded. Yeah, exactly. So the, <clears throat> these ones, there's probably hundreds of thousands that happen on the earth every single year, but on Mars, it's a pretty big deal. And this was, this was measured by this insight lander. Now this insight lander landed on Mars, uh, on November, uh, 20 in November, 2018. So it's been there for about 1,200 Martian days or souls, if you've watched uh, The Martian, which is slightly longer than an Earth day. And it's measured 1,313 quakes. Um, and as Jason said, what that's allowed them to do is to look at the seismic waves that pass through Mars from all these various earthquakes and try and get an idea of what the um, submerged structure of Mars looks like. So what does it look like under the surface? And you can tell by the way the the speed that the waves move, the angles that they come in at, the angles that you can't get them from, and so on and so forth. Exactly the same way that we do in uh, or on the Earth with seismometer stations and seismic stations. Yeah, I am curious um, what limitations or what you can get from a single station um, yes. as opposed to needing like four stations. Yeah, because you can't do any cross cross referencing here, right? So you, mm -hmm. it's very hard to get. I, I guess what they would have to do is make some assumptions about sort of um, spherical symmetry and things like this, because you're not going to be able to get the exact dimensions or see um, this kind of exact dimensions of the of the core and things like this. You're going to have to make some assumptions. But mm -hmm. but yeah, you can't you can't sort of um, uh, coordinate measurements from different positions on the Earth like you could uh, like you could. Have yeah, I suppose. Um you know, one of the things that you mentioned, they probably have like accelerometers in all three axes so they can tell if the wave is shaking up and down versus side to side. So. Now, apparently, um, apparently this earthquake is close to the upper limit of what the scientists had expected to see on Mars. And as you, as you say, this is, these measurements along with previous measurements have helped us to work out what the inside of Mars might look like. And as we might expect, it looks quite similar to a to a rocky type planet, just like the Earth would be. Looks like mm -hmm. it has a thin crust on the top, which is between twenty four to seventy two kilometers thick. They say now that looks that sounds to me like quite a big margin for error, but at least it says it's sort of in that similar Earth like range um, of about twenty four to seventy two kilometers. They say there might be a little bit of tectonic activity and they say it has a thick mantle, which probably has only one layer, unlike the Earth, which has kind of two distinct layers of an upper and a lower mantle. And then it has a core of iron, which you would expect because the more dense materials um, settle, to the, settle to the middle, which they think, or they're not too sure, is liquid or solid. So it looks like it's actually quite similar in structure to the earth i mean i guess you'd expect that right yeah well i mean it's always going to be differentiated i think the there might be some minerals that you get uh in the lower mantle that you don't form because the pressure doesn't get so high mars is a tenth of the mass of the earth mm -hmm. and so um you know that's going to affect the pressures that you get and the temperature that you're going to get mm -hmm. uh another thing um you know i wonder if the fact that they saw in on it's a thousand days is what you said basically uh, that they've been there yeah they've been there 1200 days so i guess it's sort of four, so the fact that they saw the in 1000 days of observations they saw the largest kind of earthquake that they would have expected yeah um tells you probably that over the course of a century you would have some that are you know maybe a factor of 10 higher than that yeah yeah so it's, and i uh, it's i wonder if because if you only have a tenth of the mass to shove around, um, maybe that doesn't matter because earthquakes happen on kind of a localized scale. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you don't have the same kind of surface gravity. So there's less energy to to go around to produce these uh, Mars quakes. So if you were to take the same, you know, some of the same physical parameters in terms of how much did a fault slip or something like that, and you put it on the Earth, that probably correlates to a significantly <laughs> larger earthquake than what was registered there. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how to do that scaling. I might have to have a chat with uh, with someone who specifically works 
works on this, but it is interesting. And like you say, it's probably allowed them, they haven't published their full results yet, but it should allow them to build up some idea over four years of a kind of statistical distribution of the size of these quakes you get over the mm -hmm. four years, like you would on the earth. Um, yeah, and they might be able to also isolate, you know, where are the regions where there's active mm -hmm. crustal movement. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that they're tectonic plates. Um, I think that's been pretty established, but like what this is, you know, just like the crust settling down mm -hmm. as the core cools off or something like that. Yeah, I've, I've not heard of anything that says there's sort of the, the tectonic plates like that. But like you say, I think tectonic just means settling, bulging of the crust and these kind of things that cause these mm -hmm. uh, these shifts. The interesting thing about this, which is which has come out recently, is that they got this measurement just as the thing was apparently about to die. So the place where this thing is settled, I forget the exact name of the place now. I've got it in here so somewhere if i can find it elysium planicia so the place where it's set down is uh, mars is obviously famous for its dust storms and here is a picture of the current state of the insight lander now the, the lander doesn't have any ability so these at the front here are the solar panels of the insight lander which powers the lander and they're entirely covered with martian dust now um and there's there's simply no way to clean it off. The idea was that it would be cleaned by the dust devils and the wind on on Mars, but unfortunately that hasn't happened. And it went into standby mode in the last couple of weeks. So here's what- Holy it, moly, that's the- yeah, Exactly, so here's the, here's the before- <laughs> That looks like my countertops. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the before and after. So here's the nice clean uh, InSight lander when it landed back in uh, November, 2018, I guess with a nice clean solar panels, getting lots of energy to run the lander. And then here is the status now, basically. It's just completely clogged up with this dust. And it's, uh, yeah, it's now dying. So on May the 7th, so that's three days, just three days after it registered this massive quake. And uh, it shut off. You know, 1,200 days into. So very, very lucky it, it shut off. It basically went into safe mode. Um, where it suspends everything but the most critical functions. And unless it gets cleaned off, which I don't think they have much hope for, that's probably the the end of the mission. But it, but it has been one of these missions, and you'll be able to speak to this, which has gone massively beyond anything that they probably could have expected at the start. So I think, I think they said it was supposed to end at the end of 2020. And where oh, so they got two extra years out of it, and they've got yeah at least a year and a half extra, and that seems to be pretty much the way most of these missions go, right? I think isn't Curiosity still rumbling around? And um, let's see. So Kepler, yeah, I think Kepler Curiosity's went still on for going. Years. All of so things. well, the the big ones were um, Spirit and Opportunity that were supposed to be ninety days, and they ended up being nine years. <laughs> um, but uh, that goes to show, you know the way that they're engineered is we need to have a 99% or 99.9% assurance that this part is not going to fail in the course of the mission lifetime, which means that, you know, you're cutting off yeah. this low probability tail yeah, yeah. that stretches deep into the future. Um, that's a nice way. So, that's a nice way of explaining it actually. So that the, the probability is that you're, you're going to outlast or overshoot that because you're, you're putting in such a large margin for error, right? In, in being able to achieve those initial physics goals and that initial length of the mission. That right. The likelihood is that you're gonna overshoot quite significantly, which which makes so, sense. So, and you may have a, a single part that fails, which would have failed the mission initially, but then once the mission starts and it gets going and then they're like, oh, okay, this thing stopped working. Well, we found a, a way to work around it or we, well, we just won't use that and we'll use everything else instead. You're talking about um, the drive wheels now, aren't you? Of uh, was it? I well, so Kepler or Kepler? Um, you know that was a that was unfortunate because there had been questions about the reaction wheels beforehand um, about their longevity, but you know it is what it is. But the, you know, with any other mission, Spitzer, for example, it was known that Spitzer was going to run out of coolant because um, they had to cool the long wavelength detectors because the Earth is and the instruments are bright. And so um, if you want to see in long wavelength, you, your instrument has to be colder than the stuff you're looking at. Mm. And 
so they had some coolant in there and then when the coolant ran out they just said okay well we won't use that part of the those instruments we'll use the short wavelength instruments and we'll keep operating and they kept operating for you know what like a decade spitzer launched in 2003 something like that or yeah. was commissioned in 2003 um maybe it was 2004 maybe it was 2000 anyways it was around around that time and it lasted 15 years instead of five yeah so and there's the same thing will likely happen with jwst although i don't know um the detailed decommissioning plan but it's basically a five-year mission with um for the long wavelength stuff and then eventually the telescope's going to heat up to the point where you can't get good data with it anymore Arjun says, uh, so unlucky not to get dust deviled. Yeah. So I can't help but think on here, could they not just have had like a, a brush attached to something? Yeah. Uh -huh. and sort of, but, uh, <clears throat> or I like a canister of yeah. like a canister of the air, the air bottle. It's got to be something. <laughs> Although that got to be something the, to work around. What would happen? The pressure would change by a factor of 100. <laughs> That's true. I hadn't thought about that. It'd probably just rip everything to pieces. Um, but that surely there's that, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what the energy requirements are and how, how low on power it runs, but surely there could have been a, you know, a little thing that comes out with a brush and just tries to, tries to do a little bit of something. But, mm. uh, yeah, it looks like, uh, unfortunately that one's on its last legs, unless it, um, unless a nice little dust devil comes along and, and does it a little bit of work for us. Um, mm. kind of like that AI machine that had to constantly keep bringing the fluid that it needed to survive, like constantly keep squeegeeing it back into itself. Exactly. Did you see that? I, 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 oh, no, no, no. But, I, I know which one you're talking about. I know which one you're talking about. So there's about. the AI robot that- It's an um, art installation, isn't it? Uh -huh. it's an, maybe I can find it. It's um, leaking this fluid and it needs that fluid in order to run. And so it's constantly squeegeeing the fluid back. Art installation. Um, <laughs> what is it? Uh, fluid. Um, maybe that hydraulic fluid. It must be this one. I think it's this one. Yeah, it's yeah this that's one. the one. So talk us talk us through what's happening here, Jason. Uh, so I guess whatever that stuff is on the ground, the oil or whatever, is essential for the operation of the instrument, and it leaks out, and the instrument is basically told that it needs to keep it. Um, it, it needs to squeegee it back in towards itself. And so it um, spends its life, you know, figuring out, okay, where, where is this stuff leaking away? And I got to scoop it back in. And if it fails in its mission, then the, then the machine will die. Basically the machine will stop functioning. <laughs> yeah. So this is like the coolant or oil or whatever, or fuel it needs to run. So the AI of the thing is trying to get more as it's leaking out. And like you say, if it doesn't get enough in a certain amount of time, it essentially dies. So this is uh quite a cool uh, little art. Yeah, I mean, there were, there, I've heard, there were a number of people who were saying, you know, this looks like torture. Um, you have something that's, you know, a kind of a budding intelligence that you're putting in a situation where if it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't function, then it dies. Um, well, I mean, I can, and it's certainly but, but an interesting point philosophical art, argument it? to it make. Was, it was like, yeah. I think that's, that's exactly the argument they were making, which is like, you know, we work all day just to get enough, mm -hmm money or food or whatever to keep going yeah. on it's kind of but that's the story of life it's like welcome to life right you know <laughs> humans forever have been you know do i do i eat today or do i um do something else you know i and if i'm going to eat then i need to go out and you know face down a ferocious animal or <laughs> uh work in the fields or something or apparently um, AI, i can't say that i personally face down robot that we're gonna have to uh, face down in the future i think yeah, so I I haven't personally chased after any ferocious animals, but um, you know certainly the human condition is one of trying to stay alive. <laughs> exactly. So so we need one of these dust devils to come along, or it looks like that's the end of the mission, and that leads nicely into the um, the next part. So there's been a study released on the weather essentially in the Jezero crater, which is where the Perseverance rover is now can you tell us anything about the the weather on mars because the the perception <laughs> is that huge dust storms constantly is this and if you've um, seen i don't the, think if you've seen the martian this is what sort of depicted isn't it that these these rolling dust storms coming along all the time so a few things to be aware of is that um 
wind that blows at the same speed as the wind that blows on the earth mm -hmm. would only have one one hundredth of the energy. And it's, so because it's, it's kV, so it's squared. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So because the velocity, if the velocity is the same, you're only getting one one hundredth of the mass that's going by. And so um, it's not going to be like a hurricane, even if it's has the same kind of structure as a tornado or a stru same structure as a hurricane. It's not going to have the same kind of power because there isn't there's one one hundredth of the mass yeah. that's blowing it's, around. It's in the not atmosphere. as much air hitting you if you're. Right. If you're in the way of it. So, um, but a dust storm, you know, part of what makes a dust storm is just how opaque the atmosphere mm -hmm. becomes. So I don't think that it's constant. I believe that it's seasonal um, because Mars crosses the surface temperature of Mars on its elliptical orbit crosses the line where it's the sublimation point of carbon dioxide. Oh, so wow. the, when Mars is far from the sun, the, it's below the freezing point of carbon dioxide on the surface. And so the, and Mars's atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. And so it freezes to the surface. So the half of the atmosphere gets frozen to the surface. And then when it comes to the close approach to the sun on the, you know, cause it's an elliptical orbit, it's far from the sun for half the orbit and then close to the sun for the other half of the orbit. When it comes close to the sun, it crosses back over that sublimation point and then that atmosphere re-evaporates off at the surface and that i think is when you get the big dust storms oh wow i did uh, that i did not know that's an amazing that's an amazing fact so here in the image is uh they're a little so, bit and it may happen both ways right it, yeah. it, um it doesn't necessarily just one way or the other but that's the thing that's i think driving the global dust storms is is the fact that the atmosphere is freezing to the surface and then evaporating back off again so these are kind of fuzzy images because they're taken from earth telescopes of mars so on the left you've got a kind of, you know, half decent picture of Mars from an Earth telescope. And then you've got during one of these global dust storms. So they can become an entire planet consuming thing. There's huge dust storms that you can even see from Earth based telescopes. But as you said, they're they're sort of generated by these changes in the atmosphere and they're in turn generated by heat reaching the surface. So these actually sort of blow themselves out because they cover all of the all of the planet the heat can't get in any longer and they kind of blow themselves out the energy dissipates but you do get these huge dust storms and they've managed to sort of um get a load of information on these in Jezero crater so they published a paper based on what they'd seen in the crater they've been there what now sort of just over a year right when did uh can't remember when perseverance landed uh Maybe, maybe, sounds about right. Maybe, a maybe, year and a half, maybe. Yeah, maybe longer. But they've published these from basically the first year of observations. Because what they've got on um, on Perseverance is what they're calling the new robotic meteorologist, which is this um, sensor that's called MEDA. Now, MEDA is the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer. So it has wind sensors to essentially detect how fast the wind is moving. It's got light sensors that can detect these these whirlwinds and when dust is being thrown up into the atmosphere. And it's got these uh, sky facing cameras and sideways facing cameras so that they can catch these um, these swirling dust devils and any clouds of dust that come up. And they have seen that Jezero Crater is apparently an incredibly active place for quote unquote weather. So here is a really nice um, video. So it's like saying, Oklahoma. Is that what Oklahoma is like? Is that is, so that, that, is that what Oklahoma well, that's is what, like? Uh, well, the Midwest of the United States in general is, I think the the overwhelming majority of tornadoes happen in the Midwest. Hmm. Um, and it has to do with, it's a big flat plain. And um, the it's also where two different pockets of jet streams pass, depending on the season. I don't, I don't know all the details about it, but um that would be something let me look it up real quick lionel says in space nobody can hear your drive wheels fail <laughs> and he said does he said a lot of telescopes seem to uh fail on their uh drive wheels is this uh one company that's doing them or do we need to have a look into this 
Oh, and it was a specific company or that was producing the reaction wheels. We don't use so them. here's, um, let me share this with you just so you can see where the tornadoes all happen. And I think globally it's, you know, the United States to first order is the only place that gets tornadoes. Where did you send it? Email or? Yeah, I'll send it by email. All right, if you send it on the email, I'll, uh, I'll punch it up. Oh, actually I can, I can send it here. Or on the chat on the, on the thing, I think. Yeah, got it. So, uh, can I grab that? I should be able to. Oh, it's gone into there. I'll put it across. So there we go. Can you see that? Yeah. So May, May tornado, t right, okay. So where's Oklahoma in there? My US geography is terrible. Um, it's right in the middle of the red part. Okay, makes it's sense. It's the one that looks like a, I don't know, a cup. It's got the panhandle that uh, goes to the- So this one here, basically, around here, yeah. yeah. Cool. Right. So it captured all of these. Uh, let me get back to where let me get back to where I was. So where are we? I'm trying to find a world map. But anyways, it's the United States has more than its fair share of tornadoes. <laughs> so, yeah, so they've managed to they managed to um, see all of these cool dust devils. So just to be clear for anyone who's watching, these are the dust devils that the cameras captured in Jezero Crater from the Perseverance rover. So this is a really, really nice little video showing the activity that's going on uh, in Jezero Crater. They also picked up these larger gusts of Martian dust, which would be, I guess, the kind of thing that's depicted on the Martian. And these, they think, are responsible for the level of dust that's in the atmosphere all the time, which is quite a lot, as we saw, settling onto InSight Lander and places like this. So they captured these larger gusts that pick up sort of huge amounts of dust and then dump them back to the back to the floor. So I think if we look at the um, look at the data that they've got, they said they get about um, about four of these whirlwinds past Perseverance every single day. And most wow, of them. That's are, a lot. Yeah, lots of them. And about noon, uh, about noon, they usually get one every single day on average. Um, and these huge gusts, which they're calling these gust lifting events, which is like this one we're seeing on the screen at the moment. They've only seen three of those over about 300 days. So they seem to be one every sort of 100 days. So these are the these are the more violent events, I guess. So this is the biggest one, which they took um, last year in June. And it's a huge cloud that covered about 1.5 square miles or four square kilometers. So oh. these are much more infrequent, but they cover a much larger area. So they actually think that Jezero is on a kind of storm track from north to south. So compared to where um, InSight Lander is. So if we bring them up, Perseverance is here in Jezero Crater and InSight is um, about 2000 miles away. So it's not going to be trundling over there to clean it off, I don't think. But um, much stronger storms here and much more activity there. So apparently it's a really cool place. Um, mm -hmm. Perseverance has land to look at the weather on Mars, which I'd never really thought about, to be honest. Cool. Yeah, so apparently there are other places where tornadoes happen. Um, Russia, South Africa, Australia. You're, and so, you're so US centric. You see? Yeah, I know. <laughs> but th this doesn't even have this doesn't have a, a gradient on it, so it's hard to see. Um, the the one that I just sent doesn't have a gradient on it, so you, oh, you, it's hard to see the density. Did you send it in chat? Yeah. Okay. Let me let me bring that back up. Ah, okay. So these are tornado places around the around the world, I guess. Nice. Yeah, I mean they call it Tornado Alley in in the United States. So I guess there's I guess there's a similar tornado alley which they haven't been able to because obviously they don't have rovers all over the place on Mars. They haven't been able to find out exactly where these tornadoes are, where the distributions are around the around the uh, the planet. But I guess there would be something similar on Mars. Obviously, you need mm -hmm. more 
more coverage and more uh, and more landers to work this out, this out exactly. But well, and the topology of the surface and yeah, yeah. So they say that one of the reasons they think that Jezero is so active is because you have a crater and a rough surface, which essentially helps things to be kicked up. So that might be that might be a part of the reason. Now they they ended on a particularly depressing note for for insight, which is, uh, and I quote from the uh, from what they said. They said perseverance is nuclear powered. So the perseverance rover is nuclear powered. It's not solar panels. But if it were solar panel powered, we wouldn't have had the problems that uh, insight has had. So if insight was where perseverance is. There would uh -huh. be enough dust, enough dust devils, definitely, to clean it off. Yeah. So they sent them. Neener, to, neener. They sent them to the wrong places, basically. Uh -huh. Should have sent uh, sent insight there. Um, and what was the final thing? The only problem is apparently because the activity is so strong in Jezero Crater, it's actually damaged some of Meda's wires. So even though you said there's not a lot of energy in the wind, and you were right. It's still got this sort of grinding dust, so you get this sort of yeah. Effect. It can it can be abrasive, and I'm curious um, how the dust compares to dust like on the Earth. So, for example, dust on the Moon is really abrasive mm. because the dust on the Moon forms from collisions of micrometeorites. Yeah. So you have basically cosmic dust coming in, impacting the Moon, and shattering the rock, like fragmenting the rock. And so the shards that come from that are really um, angular it's not it's not weathering like river rocks in the earth they're not smooth little you know nice um, sand they're really abrasive sharp edges and stuff like that because they're basically um, shards that come from the fragmentation of the rock surface from the collisions and so I'm curious um, what the nature of the dust is in the atmosphere of Mars when these things come by are they um worn the same way that dust on the earth is worn or are they worn more like like are they really abrasive or are they more rounded um type things i suspect that it's closer to the dust it, it's not as congenial as <laughs> sand for example on the earth yeah so that, especially that seems to be what they're near the beaches in the articles that i've read that it's incredibly abrasive it gets you know, it gets in the drive wheels and grinds everything down, basically. It's mm -hmm. a really difficult thing to deal with. And they also mention in here um, that it's slightly electrostatically charged. So it tends mm -hmm. to settle down on things like the InSight Lander, which has yeah, some I, I can see of that. charge as well. So I, I, a difference would be, you know, a lot of the sand on the earth is near the, on the beaches. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to walk barefoot on the moon yeah. um, like we would on the beach. Uh, you know, it'd be like walking barefoot on cement. Um. Yeah, so it's not it's not particularly nice. So it looks like um, I'm, I'm not sure from reading the article whether they've worked out a workaround, but it, I think some of it is damaged. So whether we'll find out a lot more about the weather, I don't know. But as you kind of alluded to at the start, it's really important to know about this stuff for sending new missions or just for understanding mm -hmm. how the how the dust will damage or settle on future missions because if mm -hmm. you if you're just going to send solar panels there's an increased risk that it's just going to get covered in dust and you're not going to be able to use it again so yeah well and you know if you're going to send a person and if you're going to send a person and they land in this crater and it's like oh look my spacesuit wore out 6 months before it was supposed to <laughs> um that's what do you problem. want me to do? Yeah, that's a big problem as well. Exactly. So it's really important, not just from a kind of cool perspective to understand the weather up there, but also if we're going to send anything there, really important for the solar panels and for grinding any uh, any surfaces inside these these rovers as well. So it mm -hmm. really informs what we sent. I don't know if you picked up on this. I just wanted to, seeing as we're finishing up on Mars, I thought we'd just chat about this quickly because it was doing the rounds on... Uh, on Twitter and so forth, the door that they said they'd found on Mars, which uh, which showed that aliens obviously live on Mars. Did you come across this? I, I did see the picture and I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Any thoughts? 
Uh, it's probably not a door. <laughs> okay. It's definitely not a door. It looks really interesting. And people have been saying it looks like a sort of Egyptian, you know, um, pyramid door. Now, that sounds interesting and kind of convincing until you realize that you get the scales. How big do you think this thing is? Uh, probably pretty small. One foot high. So, so they're small Martians. That so, they're, live there. so they're small Martians, apparently, who, who like Egyptian architecture. Like, or, like the like the trolls or the dwarfs that live. Um, the ones that live in, in the, the south of the, the Alsace. The the southern part of the Alsace. There's a um, a Grotto de Nan with a bunch of dwarves that live in it. Really? That would come out and play with the children. <laughs> so until one of them got their feelings hurt, and then they don't play with the children anymore. Well, apparently the the very small Martians living on Mars. And then apparently if you also boost the contrast, which is kind of difficult to see in this image, it only goes back like a few feet. You can actually see that this sort of doesn't go anywhere. So either the door is closed by a second door or it just sort of doesn't go anywhere. And uh -huh. geologists have sort of looked at this and they just said, look, that's where the Holy Grail is located. Apparently, apparently. So the, the night is in there now, I think. But uh, apparently these are just regular formations that we expect to get every now and again when you have wind erosion of of these uh, of these sand dunes, and it's uh, it's nothing that you that you kind of wouldn't that you wouldn't yeah. So expect. what you would do is you would go down to southern Utah and walk around and say, have, "Do I ever see anything that looks like this?" Exactly. And the answer is probably yes. Exactly. So I just sent you a picture of the kind of improvisation that would have to happen if you were to send someone to the surface of Mars without really understanding, um, you know, having a sufficient understanding of how the weather would interact with it. On the moon, there's no weather. So um, it's probably easier to respond to where on Mars there is weather, which means it adds a bunch of uh, uncertainty that you wouldn't otherwise get. But so they had these, this is the tire of the moon landers with the Apollo missions. And um, what they didn't appreciate was just how fine and how uh, how fine the dust was, and therefore how easy it was to kick it up into the air. And so the mud flaps over the tires weren't big enough, so they had to duct tape this piece of cardboard basically to prevent the dust from getting thrown up into their <laughs> into their suit. These are low tech solutions to difficult problems, but uh, nice, good stuff. Right, so where do we go to? So, so yes, this door apparently is nothing, nothing you wouldn't expect. But it led me down a little bit of a of a of a cool rabbit hole. So there's there's these um, images. So apparently this is an idea called haven't come across it before, but it makes sense. Called uh, pa pareidolia, pareidolia, which is basically where you see uh, things that you think are common in images, mm -hmm. but they're not actually there. So what do you think? And I wanted to, to run a, through a few by you and see if you got the same, uh, the same thoughts. So what do you think we, what do you see in this, in this picture and what is it? Um, you mean like Jupiter's great red spot? Right. And it's supposed to look like, I don't know, is that a Pokemon or something? <laughs> so it's a, it's an angry face. Apparently this is, this okay. is angry Jupiter. So it's, it's seeing, it's like when you look in the wood grain on your table and you think you see a face or you think you see, you know, a country yeah. or whatever it is. It's seeing common patterns in in things where, where they're not really there. Seeing Jesus in a piece of toast and these these kind of things. Yeah, well, but, I'm making a toaster that does that, so <laughs> then I can sell. <laughs> that would be a good idea. Here's my favourite one. Um, this is apparently no. the, the house that looks like Hitler. Do you see that or do you not see but, that? I can see it. Well, I can see the picture. I don't see. You don't. You don't see it. I, well, I, I it's a it's a bit of a stretch, right? You have to really, <laughs> have to really stretch. It's it out. difficult if the picture is not there, but when the picture's there, it looks it looks more, uh, it looks more, uh, more obvious. So there's a few in here which apparently people say they've seen. One is a jet engine. So can I get this? Can I get this picture? Here we go. A jet engine on Mars, apparently. No, that's not a jet engine. That's a pod racing engine. <laughs> a Tatooine pod racing engine. So basically, if you and, and you you had the right sort of way of looking at this, 
if you've got wind erosion, you're going to get odd shapes every now and again. And if we have enough coverage and enough pictures, occasionally we're going to see the the uh, one or two odd things. But when yeah, I mean, how many how rocks, many rocks have has the mission looked at? Like millions. You know, probably millions, right? Like millions. So here's one that they think was a a female warrior statue. So if we zoom in a little bit here, again, they think that this is the head of a female warrior that was carved. Um, no, you know, you know, that, you're not that does not that. look like a female warrior. So again, I, I apologize for their imagination. <laughs> <clears throat> if you hadn't seen these things, right? If you or if you didn't already go looking for these things, you probably wouldn't have seen these. So I'm going to start a little side show, a slideshow. And I'm going to see if you can... Oh, that one, now, that one's definitely a face. That one's definitely a face, apparently. But when you see it from a different angle, it's just it's just that nothing. Very famous one, the face on Mars. So I wanted to show you a few and see okay. and see if you could think what they are without... without I'll get the, I'll get the, uh, the name off the, uh, the top. So what are we seeing? All right. Well, I mean, aside from the... That's actually... It's not a spoon. It's a matate. So they... People think that this is a spoon. So again... You're just seeing stuff in the images of weird rocks, right? You see mm -hmm. a rock. How many rocks have you seen? Millions, millions. Eventually. See, that's that's where the woman warrior would grind her corn um, to make. Don't give them any ideas. Don't bring them together on the one on the one hat. Because they have to have good Mexican food on Mars. They a light in the distance. Apparently, this was caused by a cosmic ray just going going along. This one. Any thoughts on what people thought this one? Would um, be? That looks like a plastic bag from the grocery store that someone threw out the window of the car and is now working its way down the freeway every time a truck <laughs> drives by. It does, look or like as that. the British would say, a lorry drives by. They thought it was a gold deposit on Mars, so people were apparently uh, desperate to get up there and do a little bit of mining. So people uh, thought this was a gold. I deposit. suspect not. If you wanted to do gold, you wouldn't do it on Mars. You would just grab an asteroid. What about this one? People got very, very uh, excited about this one. That looks like Humpty Dumpty after he fell. <laughs> uh, particularly this region in here. What do you think people thought this one was? Uh, like a mushroom? A human thigh bone, apparently. That is a very flat human thigh bone. Yeah, it's, this, it's not particularly convincing. No, that's definitely Humpty Dumpty. But there's actually absolutely loads of these. People say this one's a squirrel. Uh, a plastic bag again, like you mentioned. A woman just yeah. walking around, apparently on Mars, which makes no, no sense. I mean, come on, that's that's definitely Yeti. <laughs> that, it definitely does look like a Yeti. And then a carved statue of a, a neo Assyrian deity. So this is uh, parody. What, 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 I can't remember the word. I absolutely destroy the word. Paridolia, which is seeing common objects in on. Uh, in common occurrences so mm -hmm. yeah lots of stuff been seen on mars apparently but it's very easy to trick ourselves so this door on mars that people have been talking about it's, yeah it's really nothing it's a it's a cat flap at best that seems to go nowhere and uh yeah but if you were camping there you know you could hide something there to keep it sheltered from the wind you could you could probably you could you could probably use it the the next thing i wanted to go on to was uh one that i came up uh, or came across um, today, actually, which was uh, this. Uh, is it this one? Not that one. This one. So an astronomer has come up with an idea that the Milky Way galaxy may contain four malicious alien civilizations that could attack the Earth. OK, so we got the Borg. We got the Romulans. <laughs> I was going to go for Stargate, to be honest, but yeah, we'll go with that. And the Stargate, like the gold, derpy. the gold, yeah, all of these, all of these uh, ones. So he came up with four. How do you think he did this, and and what was the methodology? Uh, well, so he probably just said, okay, what do we know about like life and star formation and planet formation, and then you make an estimate about how many um, civilizations there might be, and then what fraction of them are malicious and then you come up with a number and he got four yeah so what he and did then is he said that there's uh 15,785 exoplanets in our galaxy and then he wait, went only only 15,000 that's what or I, habitable 
I, they... guess, I guess habitable ones that he's he's sort of narrowed down. Then he then he went and looked at conflicts in the twentieth century mm-hmm. and how many nations have invaded other nations, and then folded those together and came up with there'll be four aggressive planets. Thoughts okay. on that methodology? Because that sounds. I've got some thoughts on that methodology. Well, so I don't mind the methodology more than I mind the headline. So um, he was probably like, okay, let's put some numbers in and see what I come up with. Okay, it sounds good. And then you turn it over to the, it gets reported by the science journalist who's like, okay, what kind of headline can I make out of this? Yeah. They, we, sh- we, should, we should make that clear at this point. We're not having any go at a particular researcher who's trying to work out an interesting number. That's That's fine. But then the... The idea that the uh, the Washington Post or whatever, who is it, New York Post, has run off with and say that this is pretty much sort of gospel is a little bit of a is a little bit of a stretch. So so extending from there, you're essentially saying that all these alien species behave like 20th century humans, which makes no sense because they could be millions of years ahead of us or, you know, they could be just pond scum millions of years behind us. And then mm-hmm. the frequency of conflict of those vastly different types of civilizations to say that they all sort of roughly balance out to be 20th century human like seems very, very um, earth centric, shall we say? Well, I mean, so you have to get to the point where um, you have the technology to be able to attack a distant thing. And so yeah. I, I, I don't know that I you know, the presumption that life would develop at least the, you know, the evolutionary forces that exist on a planet probably exist that those are probably fairly universal, Mm. you know, competition for resources and, and things like that. So I don't know that I have an issue with the premise. It's not an unreasonable premise to start from. It doesn't mean you can't poke holes in the premise, but um, I, I suspect you know, once you have a life form that gets sufficiently well advanced that it can generate the technology or develop the technology that it takes to travel, then it has to go through the same phase that we've gone through in the 20th century. So that's what, that's what I'm saying about the methodology. If you, you have to have that technology to go and attack someone. And mm-hmm. if you have that technology based on what we know, which is again being Earth centric. Right. So we don't know what the probably, 23rd century looks like. Yeah. Yet. You would hope that there's some sort of enlightened friendly being rather than some uh-huh. warmongering fascist you know hitler type conqueror but who knows right yeah we'll see in, in 2100 <laughs> um, when i'm about to die we'll see what um you know how that pans out you know are, are people the still going to do battle in their own mind against the cartoon version of their political adversaries um <laughs> There's no, there's no end in sight to that one. I don't think that's. Uh, I think that'll rumble on for, for quite a while. So, a kind of, a kind of interesting study. Um, you know, we're not having a go at anyone here, but there's, the the author himself says that there's uh, significant issues with the methodology. But I guess just trying to come up with an interesting number and. Uh, yeah, well, you have to come up with, you know, what are the, what is the set of assumptions and you know, what footing do you have for each of those assumptions? So for example, I did a paper back in the day on panspermia, yeah. the idea of having life bearing material get ejected from one planet and land on another. And when you do a paper like that, you realize what the number of assumptions that go into producing it are pretty high. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if you've never done the exercise, then you don't know where to start, right? So you, you try it out and then you fudge a bunch of things because you're like, well, I don't know this number, so I'm going to make this guess. And then you see which things are fairly strongly supported from observations and which things are weakly supported. And then, you know, it gives you an idea of where to devote your research. research. It's kind of like the Drake equation, yeah. right? The Drake, Drake equation starts off with the star formation rate. Um, and it ends with the lifetime of a civilization that's you know, before it kills itself off. Right. And so you go from things that you can actually measure to ones where you have to speculate but and at every least step it gives along you a the little way bit of a guidance on the things that you don't know. Right. So they're, mm-hmm. they're known unknowns. And I guess that can guide um, future study and things like this. Mm-hmm. 
So it is it is kind of useful. Next thing is a little bit of a little bit of a change, but we're both uh, we both have a, a background in in particle physics and uh, elementary particles. This idea that neutrons have been doing something a little bit weird. So we need to do a little bit of background here. So they've been doing double slit experiment. And basically what they've tried to show and apparently have shown now is that each neutron that goes through a double slit experiment actually does split and go through both holes of a double split slit experiment at the same time. Now, this is something that hasn't been shown before, but has been inferred from the statistical patterns that we see on a screen. So mm -hmm. for a little bit of uh, a little bit of sort of grounding for people who who might not be too familiar with the, the double slit experiment. So imagine if you were throwing tennis balls, um, a macroscopic object, a big a big ball like a tennis ball through two slits. You would expect the balls go through the slits. And uh, is this the is this the image I want? Uh, no, that's that's no, the one with the inter I've, I've that's got, got an I've interference got, I've, pattern. I've moved, I've moved on uh, too far in this one. I think it's in the have we got so apparently I've uh, I've gone off and lost my image so can I bring it back apparently not anyway I'll just explain it so if we were throwing tennis balls through a hole we would expect they just go straight through the hole and we get two patches on the wall across now when we do this with light or a wave we actually get an interference pattern because what happens is the two waves or the wave goes through the two slits. The slits essentially become a um, source for two new waves because the wave can just split. And where those waves interact constructively, we get a bright patch. Where they interact destructively, we get a dark patch. So when we put waves through two slits, two holes, we get a diffraction pattern, which is bright, dark, bright, dark bright dark and uh this happens again when we do this with electrons or neutrons or quantum particles um so it seems and this is again because of destructive and constructive interference so it seems that electrons neutrons quantum particles have a wave particle duality they seem to be point particles but they also seem to behave like waves but We've never been able to kind of show this for individual particles. So when we do this with electrons, they go through the slits and they build up the interference patterns that we expect. So they behave just like waves. But we've never been able to show for an individual particle that they go through both slits at once. And apparently they've now shown that. So so any thoughts on, on this? Um, so I guess I'm not really surprised. Uh... The fact of the matter is that not only does it go through the two slits, but it goes everywhere um, and then recombines. Yeah. And so <clears throat> the. But previously, the fact... we've never been able to show this except by doing like a million electrons. Right. And building up the pattern. OK, so so that's the difference. They're saying, like, I can send one object through and demonstrate that it went through both. Correct. So so um, in these images. You, you send through a million electrons, one at a time, and they build up the pattern over time. So you send one, it lands here. You send one, it lands here. You send one, it lands here. But over a million... And then a skeptical... So then you're saying a skeptical person could say that doesn't prove that each electron went through both slits. That just Co proves correct. that... They're saying it just shows over a big sample, it builds up uh, something mm -hmm. that statistically looks like they went through both slits, but really they didn't. It went through one in particular, and then the other one went, went went through one in particular. But then they did some other new physics that we don't understand that just so made them look like they'd gone through both slits. And Okay, and so this neutron experiment, what they did is they had something that I guess rotates the spin. Yes. Um, of along one of the arms. Yes. Of the interferometer, and then the other one doesn't rotate. And so then they look at the resultant spin state of the neutron in the end is that exactly so they applied um a uh magnetic field and they put um and they looked at the spin as you say so they applied a magnetic field on one path only and then measured the effect on the neutrons spin 
And what they showed was that the individual particles experience a specific fraction of the magnetic field applied on one of the paths. So not the whole interaction that you- There wasn't expect. anything with the unity response. Yeah. So they didn't get the whole magnetic field interaction that you would expect, but they got some fraction from which they're taking that the neutron split to some extent. Right. So if the neutron had gone through one path or the other, it would have had a digital response. Either Correct. it had the magnetic precession or it didn't. Or, yes. you know, if let's pretend that magnetic precession is what they were looking at. Yeah. Um, so either it had the effect of the magnetic field or it didn't. And this is saying that it actually, when it was recombined, it showed that it had some magnetic effect, but not all magnetic but effect. Not all, but not as large as you would expect had it gone along that path. Right. So the, it took me 15 years to figure this out, but <laughs> if you think about the idea of, um, you know, when you have a particle that goes from one place to another, it takes all possible paths to do it. And then you put a contraption in front of it that restricts which paths are allowed to connect from one place to the other. Um, and then you say, okay, now advance the action along each of these things. And as long as the differences in the action between adjacent paths is small compared to H bar, then you get constructive interference. And if you have, if the action, um, the difference in the action across um, these two nearby paths is large compared to H bar, then you get destructive interference. And so that basically dictates here's what's gonna happen as this wave function propagates through all possible paths that the universe provides and then you're going to get a result in the end that shows that in fact it went through both paths on this interferometer because that's what was allowed to take place um so i it, it wasn't surprising to me that that this happens so i, I don't know if this has been peer-reviewed yet and i'm going to try and get the the chapel uh, i thought too. it was in was it in i thought i saw it in a journal um oh physical review res physical review research so i guess it, i guess it has been reviewed uh, so it, it's a little weird to think about those things with um have i got the paper maybe i've got the paper uh here it is physical review research so yes apparently yeah. has been so it, you know it is weird to think about this um but i had a talk with someone uh spencer case i think you know him Yes. Um, whereas like, you know, if you, when you bowl a bowling ball down the alley, it actually goes everywhere in the world. Um, it's wave function propagates everywhere. The question is which paths add yeah. um, constructively and which ones um, add destructively. And H bar is a very small number. And so <laughs> the action of nearby paths in order to have a, an object travel from one place to another where the action between the difference in action between those two paths is small compared to H bar. And you have a object the size of a bowling ball that's doing it. Um, that gives you a very, very narrow uh, ensemble of trajectories that will, um, that will add coherently and therefore be manifest in the real world. And that's but why, and that, that's why we it doesn't mean the bowling ball doesn't go everywhere. Usually. And that's why we don't care about these effects. Usually we can just deal with, right. In a, in a classical system and right so h bar has units of what time and energy so it's joules, so yeah, energy joule, times time joule seconds isn't it so that's going to be what that's m c squared t and so the m in that when you're the mass um that makes you large compared to h bar is isn't it like a 10 micrograms is the Planck mass? It's going to be something tiny. Right. And so if you're talking about something that is millions of times larger than the mass that would give you H bar um, and over a trajectory that is many times longer than, you know, something else, then, uh, then that really constrains the allowed quantum path so that a macroscopic object can travel. So this is, so 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 I just found this really cool because it kind of closes off that I think I think they said at the at the end it confirmed uh, if confirmed would end rearguard attempts to explain the pre the results of previous double slit experiments without resorting to superposition. So I guess there's some other wacky theories out there that 
could explain why it just so happens to look exactly yeah it's it's kind of like um you know you take an image of a black hole and now we finally 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 demonstrated that black holes exist yeah i mean it's a good experiment i'm not i'm not saying anything negative about the experiment um i think it's a certainly a useful measurement to make even if there wasn't a question about whether this actually happens um it's you know, confirming kind of... something that some that people have been working under the assumption of for a long, long time. Kind of like the Higgs mm-hmm. boson, right? It's, uh, right, yeah. So, like discovering the Higgs um, was cool. Had we but, not done it, it, yeah. But everyone had assumed it for fifty years anyway, and sort of gone about their business. So it mm-hmm. was something that needed to be done, but it probably doesn't change um, the science going forward in any particularly meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, you could imagine, though, that um, it could have changed it in a meaningful way mm. in the unlikely circumstance that it doesn't agree with what people had assumed was going on. And we never know what understanding the universe better will lead to. So it's always uh, it's always important to get onto these things. There's there's one more that I had when we're not going to get to chat about plane boarding again, are we? So we're going to have to do a special on that where you actually explain it to me properly. But because okay. um, I think you've got about 10 minutes, right? Yeah. So the other one that came up, which I noticed, was this um, unusual wrinkle in the expansion rate of the universe. Did you come across this one? I have not. You have not. But it sounds amazing. So this is Adam Adam Reese again, which I I think you uh-huh. had a story about him, isn't he? One uh, of the youngest. Oh yeah, he's, he, well, he's probably close to the youngest Nobel Prize winner because the work. I believe that the work that. Um, <coughs> he did that resulted in the Nobel prize was basically his graduate student thesis. So when did he get it in sort of 2011 for, for dark, dark energy? energy. Yeah. yeah. So he was, I, I, my understanding is he's the guy that basically did the analysis of the supernova um, measurements, like put everything together. And since that time he's been, he's, the one of only a few people who is really pushing on, we need to understand the Hubble constant. Yeah. And so a lot of his measurements, a lot of his science has been, how can we better measure the local Hubble, Hubble constant, not using supernova as a premise, but instead going out and um, looking at nearby galaxies and measuring the Hubble flow from a variety of sources. So like really um, tamping down on uncertainties in the distance ladder. You know, we, we know what the distance is to galaxies because they have Cepheid variables and then in distant other locations, they might have other kinds of sources. So, ham, you know, bolstering the distance ladder, re- removing uncertainties in it, making new measurements that use that new technology. That's kind of um, my understanding of his uh, science program that he's been working on for the last, what, 20 years so, so this is apparently exactly the problem. So they've been measuring this expansion rate of the universe using the Hubble Space Telescope, which launched in 1990. And over 30 years, they've got these measurements from 40 galaxies of these, uh, these Cepheid <clears throat> variables. And apparently they don't line up very well with the acceleration rates of the universe that we expected from uh, our models and things like the Planck mission, so the European Space Agency's Planck mission. And they especially don't line up when we look at the expansion rate of the local universe compared to further out. So we're not sure if there's a difference in the analysis between those those two groups and two sets of data, or if there's some new physics going on. So can you tell us a little bit about these, these Cepheids? Because I've never... I've not come across these. So I always thought you got the distance ladder of the universe from these like type 1A supernova and things that you, these standard candles that you had an idea of how bright they are. You you see how bright they are in the sky. So you know the kind of distance to them. And then you can get an idea of their velocity from the redshift and build up this. Yeah, have, have you ever seen those um, pictures of uh, you know craftsmen in the developing world who put together, like they'll tie a bunch of ladders together and string it across you know here one side of a ladder is on a tree and then the other side is held up by a bucket yeah, yeah. that's suspended from a chimney or something and they're walking across it that's what the distance ladder is like mm-hmm. so the distance ladder starts with um 
understanding the properties of nearby stars. So you measure, you physically measure the distance to nearby stars by triangulating from the Earth's orbit. Like parallax, parallax, basically. Right. So you get parallax measurements of the nearby stars. And then you construct from that, given what we observe with stars and the fact that we can measure their distance, now we understand that um, when we look at some more distant star where we can't measure the parallax, we can infer its distance based upon our local knowledge. So, so we assume it's sort of the same physics is going on out there. So it, what is the brightness we see and therefore how, right. how far away must it be that we see it this bright, basically? So it starts with measuring the parallax of nearby stars yeah. and everything else depends upon that. Yeah, makes sense. And so one of the things was, well, now there's these Cep Cepheid variables, which is a specific type of variable star where the brightness of the star is related to the pulsation period. Yeah. So like the brighter it gets, the longer the pulsation period or something like that, which I'm, I'm sure is the right order. But it's a well-defined, understood thing. We understand right. how and the there's a, work. We even in that case have a theory that describes, you know, how do Cepheid variables, um, like what drives the pulsation. Mm -hmm. So Cepheid variables was the next step in the distance ladder, basically. Okay. So you do the nearby stars yeah. and then you connect that to Cepheid variables and Cepheid variables are brighter than the average star. And yeah. so you can see them at larger distances. Yeah. Um, and you assume and, those Cepheids work the same as you go out into the more right. distant universe, basically. Yeah. And then you say, okay, well now what about H2 regions? What's the distribution and sizes of H2 regions? And we can see those in even more distant galaxies. And then you say, well, okay, now we can say, <laughs> What about the average size of a distant galaxy? And then and then you connect it to supernova. Yeah. Right. So the connection, like supernova, type 1A supernova as standard candles, is many rungs up of this kind of rickety distance ladder. Yeah. Um, and so when you have new missions, so Hipparchus was in the late 80s and early 90s, I think. And that expanded the number of stars that we had measured the distance to. So like the distance ladder is predicated on physically measuring through triangulation, the distance to nearby stars. The Hipparchus mission took us from something like 10,000 stars to 100,000 stars. So all of this, all of our projections into the distant universe are based upon our knowledge of the yeah. actual positions of 100,000 stars. Now that's actually changed now because the Gaia mission, which is currently operating, um, is something like a billion stars. So it's measured the parallax of many 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 stars and as a consequence everything is being refined yeah. now that our ability to understand the properties of stars has evolved significantly over the last decade and will continue to evolve as we comb through the gaia data and piece this all together um so but there has been some tension uh, meaning like the results disagree and as we get make new measurements the uncertainty in each of those measurements gets smaller and therefore the results are disagreeing even more now than yeah. they were in the past yeah. um, because the separation between the two measurements is bigger than the uncertainties in but, the measurements. But, but, but this sort of, sort of, from the way you've explained it as well, it, it sort of makes sense because if you're using loads of different physics, loads of different objects, you're, you're stringing them all together. You've got so much different physics going on and how you combine them is you have to combine them very delicately. So mm -hmm. eventually you're probably going to run into the limit of your knowledge of these objects. And and there's going to be a discrepancy between that ladder that's four rungs further out and the one mm -hmm. that's much easier to measure in the local. In the local yeah, well, universe, right? like a, a good example would be the neutrino, the solar neutrino measurements where, um, look, we've discovered neutrinos that should tell us how the sun shines. And then you build an experiment and you look at how the sun shines and you end up getting you know, half of the neutrinos that you expect. Okay, so you say, well, you know, half isn't that bad. You know, it gets at the right order of magnitude. But then as you keep making those measurements, yeah. the uncertainty in the half that you expect goes down and down and down. And so it really is yeah. half or a third yeah. of what you expect. And then you have to start wondering, okay, what are we missing here? Yeah. Um, because our, our understanding of our detector has improved, our understanding of the sun has improved, and now the mismatch is becoming... Um, a real issue to, to, to put some numbers to that i think they've got Planck. the Planck mission said that uh the hubble constant was 67.5 plus or minus 0 0.5 whereas these new measurements with cephids are saying 73 plus or minus one so then mm -hmm. they now become significantly different 
to the point right. to the point that this this can't be explained by a lack of um, a lack of statistics. It can only be explained by a failure in the model or new physics. Right, a failure. Um, that there's something missing in either how we're interpreting one set of data or how we're interpreting the other set of data. So there, there's got to be some or both, I guess. Yeah, or both. There's got to be something now where we have to go back to the drawing board and say, you know, what do we understand in how we construct these things, and what do we what are we missing in how we construct these things, or what are we missing in terms of the actual properties of the universe that would lead to um, having these two measurements turn out different, as different as they are. Yeah, and, and I think that's going to be the sort of idea going forward with this. So that they don't, having read read about it, they don't seem to understand what the problem is yet. So mm -hmm. as, as you kind of allude to that, it's going to be digging back into uh, how did we do these measurements? What physics did we put in? What assumptions did we make about these these Cepheids or these um, or these supernova or the parallax measurement. I guess the parallax measurements are quite simple. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, but what assumption did we make about the physics of these objects and how did we string together? That right, and it that could come down to, um, my suspicion is that the Cepheid results are probably, um, <clears throat> those are probably pretty tight in the like how robust the our understanding of Cepheid variables is probably pretty well constrained, especially now given results from Kepler and um, like, you know, our stellar models related to astroseismology and the new measurements from uh, Hubble Space Telescope, which is, I think, where he's making a lot of these observations from. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that there's a, my gut feeling is that there's a lot more assumptions that are going into understanding the cosmological um, signatures, yeah. like what assumptions are going into our claims to, uh, to know how bright uh, type 1a supernovas are. Yeah. And then there's Espe also, especially at like huge, huge redshifts <clears throat> or whatever. Mm -hmm. like... Yeah. Like do, do type 1a supernova evolve like, does their brightness evolve over time? That's probably not really where the issue lies um, because the composition shouldn't be all that different from one to the next. Uh, but I will say that um, there's probably reason to re-examine our assumptions about the overall ex history or influence of dark energy mm -hmm. on the universe. If you just assume dark energy is a cosmological constant, yeah, it worked fine in the past, but you know, maybe maybe dark energy has evolved over the course, you know, since the time of recombination at 13.7 minus 400,000 years ago, 13.7 billion minus 400,000 years ago. Um, maybe there's been the properties of dark energy have not been uniform uh, over the course of that time, you know, over the age of the universe has the properties of one of the components of the universe been the same, yeah. maybe, um, so they're gonna have to they're gonna have to dig into that and work that out. Jason, I, I know you you've got to jump off. Do you want to do two minutes on how we board a plane, the best way? Because I still don't I still don't I still don't know why letting people on at the back and going forward is not the best way to do it. Two minute um, two minute quick fire on why this is uh, not the best. Yeah. Way. So the the main reason it's not the best way is because if you load from the back to the front, you're bored in a serial fashion. Okay. Um, one one person can get to their place and sit down at a time. And if you board, what you want to do is parallelize the use of the aisle. So you want everyone who's in the aisle to put their luggage away at the same time and sit down at the same time. Okay. And so uh, that means that instead of what you want to do is treat um, the, the resource is the use of the aisle. So if you just send everyone to the back of the airplane, then you have six people that are all trying to get into one row. Yeah and it limits how fast you can fill it. Um, and instead you want, you want to send enough people into the airplane so that everyone is able to maneuver their stuff around, put it away and sit down at once, because then you get, instead of doing it one thing at a time, you're doing 15 people at a time. So it's like sending one person from a row, one person from another row, one person from another row, one person from another row at the same time. And then, uh -huh. the, and then, and that, then they don't get in each other's way. They can all, you're not waiting for somebody in front of you. And then they all put their stuff away. They all sit down. And now instead of only seating three people, you've set 15 people and then you send another batch in. And so you get 
improvements because of the you've parallelized the actual process of getting out of the way. So this would need to be on a ticket beforehand, though, right? This would have to be you are boarding group some number in line to 20 and then we're calling number one now now number two and you're in that group but they could that doesn't sound like something that would be too difficult to do because they already sort of do that right they they say well boarding so the best the best way would be um well okay the most straightforward way would be to kind of do what southwest airlines does already so southwest airlines tells you what number you are in line yeah and they have these pylons these objects that say 41 to 45 and then 45 to 50 and then 50 to 55 and you just stand by your pylon yeah so that problem the fundamental aspect of getting people to line up in the right order has already been solved yeah yeah i think this would uh this this would be quite doable but do you know of anyone who's actually doing this no (laughs) they just think they just ignored it they just don't care so I don't think it was ignored. Um, I think that the industry personnel, some of them did take it kind of seriously. Um, and for example, like here's the way, reason I think about this is there was a newspaper article in about 2010 that came out 2010, 2011, that said, oh, US Airways has been exploring these things. And the, the conclusion of a two year study is that blah, blah, blah. and that the two years before then was when my paper came out. And so it happened to coincide, you know, maybe they were planning on the two year study is uh, what that guy said. (laughs) So, and I think to be honest, the most useful or maybe not the most useful, but among the useful applications of knowing the optimum method to do something Mm -hmm. is that now, you know, how much room there actually is for improvement. So it's easy to say, Oh yeah, there's always room for improvement, but that's kind of a lazy approach. You know, how much room is there for improvement? how much cost savings will there be if we make that improvement and what does it cost us in terms of either passenger goodwill, you know, like frequent flyer goodwill or, you know, just retraining everybody. And is it worth it? You know, now you can actually get to the numbers and make a real decision about, you know, what's the cost benefit analysis to making a change. If you don't know where the bottom is, then you, you don't know when to stop digging. They seem to have decided they they can't be bothered doing it though. Can't it seems to be the um the option, yeah I actually. you know there's a number of it, it's real easy for a lay person to you know tell the CEO of a billion dollar industry you know how they should <laughs> run their business um, and certainly there are places where they make gigantic mistakes but the fact that they generally function pretty well um, does not mean that it's an easy job to balance. Um, I suspect that it's a lot more complex of an issue than just getting passengers onto the airplane. Um, you know, for example, I, I believe that one of the things that happened, um, like when they started doing the uh, cost for checked luggage um, that you have to pay to check your luggage, one of the things that that did is that it filled up the overhead bins. Yeah. And when you fill up the overhead bins, that frees up cargo space. Yeah. And now you can say, oh, now we have this extra cargo space. We're going to sell it to the postal service yeah. or to UPS or something like that. You can buy, you know, you can send things in our cargo space and here's yeah. the price for you. And, you know, isn't that what you want? Don't you want your companies to be efficient and like to use, if the airplane is going to fly anyways, don't you want it to be filled as much as possible with, um, even environmentally, it's good, I guess, if you just take, yeah, I mean, stuff. you know, so there are people that gripe about the profit motive and I'm like, well, what other motive would you rather them have? You know, your, your personal political agenda motive is that, um, it just seems if you want them to run efficiently, you need to have a way to quantify what that efficiency looks yeah. like. <clears throat> Makes sense. I, I do, uh, I do like the uh, idea that you, well, it's, it's really cool that you get Stefan perfect. They call it. So the Stefan Perfect model. So it so- sounds the, like a rapper or something. Stefan Perfect. Uh-huh. The C is it the is it CGP Gray? Um, C- <laughs> CGP Gray. CGP Gray with an E. Um, he did a video, a YouTube video. Ah, yeah. There's a really good YouTube on video it. on this. I'll put it. I'll put it down in the description. And he's one of the few animators who actually animated it correctly. 
So that's one of the things I look for is like, did the animator actually do this correctly or did they not know what they were talking, what they were drawing? <clears throat> yeah, there's a there's a really nice video. So I'll, I'll make sure that's uh, that's linked down below. Good. OK, finally, I can uh, I'm going to have a read into that and uh, maybe we can do a, a proper discussion on that one. But I wanted to get it in because we always uh, we always say we're going to discuss it and then we end up we end up not doing skipping it. over it. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. All right. So those are the uh, those are the topics that that uh, that I had to be honest. Awesome discussion as ever, Jason. It's always a, it's always an absolute pleasure to have a chat with you. You've always got amazing anecdotes and these things as well. What's uh, what have you got planned for the rest of the day, rest of the weekend? Um, You'll be enjoying so, the jubilee, or you're not bothered. Well, I'm I'm happy for uh, Pierce Morgan. <laughs> I'm happy for Pierce Morgan because um, I know that he's somebody has to be. It. Somebody has to be. No, I, I, I think it's fine. I, um, I, I'm kind of a sucker for kind of old established institutions the pomp that and pageantry. Yeah. You know, like I like dressing up in my medieval monk costume to go to graduation. Um, <laughs> and so, dude, I went, I went to Cambridge, so we did that a lot. So I can't, uh, you know, uh -huh. I'm not gonna have a go at anyone for that. So, uh, I, I it, the fact that. You know, there's been a king in England or a reigning monarch in England for what 1700 years now. Um, and you know, it's it's part of the I think traditions are valuable, right? Um, there, there is value in traditions. While er, not everyone might um take the same value in those traditions or they might not see the value in those traditions. Um, they don't live in a world where those traditions don't exist. And so they don't know um, what their utopia actually would bring if they were to usher it in. Careful what you wish for, I guess, is uh, <laughs> the upshot yeah. of that maybe. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big monarchist, but uh, yeah, if they're, uh, if people are going to have a party tomorrow and. Uh, well, I mean, so it them, certainly has its downsides, king. right? So um, there are, I, I understand that there are some people who will not be in attendance and it's probably a good thing that they're not in attendance. Yeah um that's uh, that's true probably won't go too deep into that but yes def definitely you know and so i think that um there's definitely there's definitely a downside to having an aristocracy um and the aristocracy doesn't don't always live up to the ideals that are portrayed in fantasy novels um definitely definitely not what are you uh what are you what are you going to be up to for the rest of the day then and the rest of the weekend i'm um, just uh working on some training things that i'm doing and i have two papers that i'm supposed to read and uh get back get comments back to the are you reviewing authors and stuff uh actually i think that i do have a new article that i need to review so yes yes Lion Li lionel said that applications the, uh, lionel says that the person we're talking about conveniently caught covid and yeah so <laughs> I'm not a big I'm not a I'm big sick. conspiracy theorist, but um, yeah, that 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 smells a little bit fishy. But um, yeah, I'm sure it's not fishy. He's Pro probably he's probably as guilty as um, as no, people think he is. No, I mean, him I, catching COVID sounds a little bit fishy. Oh yeah, yeah, that yeah. that doesn't sound yeah. uh, like nobody cares anymore about COVID. So yeah, apparently, so yeah, so so I cut you off twice now. What are you going to be getting up to this uh, this weekend? Um, no, that's about it. It's just. Just catching up on work just regular work stuff fair enough fair enough uh, we are hiring we just hired two new faculty in our department oh um, really yeah so we have um and they're both astro people and the idea was for multi-messenger and i'm really excited about it because we're bringing in someone from ligo and we're bringing in someone from ice cube oh wow and so that it's hard to say no to like hey let's bring ligo and ice cube to unlv i mean it's gonna be <laughs> Um, it's really going to flesh out the our astronomy and astrophysics. Um, so, so group. LIGO is long the long baseline interferometer, right? Yeah, gravity wave so, detection. So, gravity wave stuff. And Ice Cube is um, dark. Isn't it a dark matter? Thing? A, I can't remember what it. It's like. a cubic kilometer Cherenkov detector in the Antarctic ice. Um, mostly neutrinos is what they're looking at. Ah, mm, uh, that's right, neutrinos. Yes, what we're talking about, neutrinos. Amazing. So it sounds like uh, exciting times at the University of Las Vegas. Yeah. So, anyways, that's basically what's happening. 
on our side. Enjoy the Jubilee. Yeah, I will. I'm going to go check out the street party tomorrow and uh, have a couple of drinks and we'll we'll see where we go. Jason, thank you so much again. Always, right, uh, thank you. always a pleasure. Not Let's not uh, wait so long next time. All right, sounds good. Thank you for everyone who uh, who watched and was watching, uh, making such uh, excellent comments and asking such great questions. I'll put Jason's um, uh, links and work down below. So go check out his stuff because he streams, does more science stuff, really awesome stuff. So go check out that stuff and uh, I'll catch you guys later. Jason, have a good weekend right. and I'll, I'll catch you soon. Sounds good. Take care, buddy. Bye, Bye now.